today if I could speak a little bit about the ethical aspects of doing next generation sequencing and what the implications might be of those. So there's general principles which govern ethics and genetics. So firstly, obviously, autonomy or the respecting of self-determination of individuals and protecting those persons with diminished autonomy, in particular children. Um, beneficence, obviously, I don't need to tell you, means do good. And non-maleficence means do no harm. And the last is justice, treating people fair, with fairness and equity and distributing the benefits and burden of health care across society as fairly as possible. There are ethical issues that pertain to genetic testing generally. Um, first is the aspect of consent, making sure that people are adequately consented for what happens. The second is access to testing itself, that everybody has adequate access. Results of unclear significance, and this isn't new to next generation sequencing. Uh, neither is unexpected findings, but we'll talk some more about that. D genetic discrimination is a very important issue that's getting a lot of attention at the moment. And then the shared nature of genetic information, whereby testing one person in the family will very often tell you about the genetic status of other people in the family as well. So when you think of next generation sequencing, whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing, all the same issues still apply as applied before. However, the order of magnitude has shifted significantly, particularly regarding consent. So you're not just consenting for one straightforward test. It's a lot more complicated than that. And the results of unclear significance is a much higher potential for getting results of unclear significance, genetic uh, discrimination, and unexpected findings. And I'd like to speak to those four issues this afternoon. I'm going to start with the last one first, which is genetic discrimination. So genetic discrimination is a terminology that was coined in 1992 by Billings et al. and is generally regarded to be the differential treatment of asymptomatic individuals or their relatives on the basis of actual or presumed genetic differences. Genetic discrimination no longer applies once the person becomes symptomatic, and that's important from a legislation point of view. It can occur in social settings, in insurance, health insurance, and life insurance, and also in employment settings as well. And studies to date have demonstrated, this is a very quick and dirty summary, but basically, there's a high percentage of people who have experienced genetic uh, discrimination. These are generally ascertained through uh, genetic support groups, um, but there's a somewhere between 25 to 30 percent at a conservative estimate have experienced genetic discrimination, and some people have experienced multiple instances of it, but a very, very small percentage actually pursue any legal action regarding it, and there's a few reasons for that too. Um, the fear of genetic dis discrimination deters people both from pursuing genetic services and also from participating in genetic research. Uh, physicians themselves are also fearful about genetic discrimination on behalf of their pa patients. And a large survey of American internal specialists has shown that this actually affects their um, uh, tendency to refer patients to genetics. And lastly, we know, we know that genetic information is used in underwriting for insurance purposes. So uh, legal and policy solutions. So um, 1992 was Billings' paper. People quickly realized there was a few papers on how much discrimination people who were carriers for sickle cell disease, who had um, are at risk for Huntington's disease, were experiencing genetic discrimination. And so UNESCO issued a statement in 1997, a universal declaration on human genome and human rights, um, which basically um, spoke to the fact that they didn't think there should be any genetic discrimination occurring. And the European Convention on Human Rights and Biomedicine um, also issued a very strongly worded um, summary from their convention. That led to the European Union Charter of Fundamental Rights, which was a legally binding document that said no individual will be discriminated against based on their genetic composition. And that applies to every EU state and overrides any existing laws within those states. In the UK, they had a human genetics commission, um, which issued a report called Inside Information, um, which again highlighted the importance of this. But preceding that, there had been a moratorium um, in association with the Association of British Insurers that basically said anybody can obtain life insurance up to the value of 500,000 pounds without having any, uh, releasing any genetic test results. And if it's greater than 500,000 pounds, then 
the people who are applying for the insurance will give their genetic information details to the genetics and insurance committee, and they will decide whether or not that it's relevant to discriminate on the basis of that. And right now, the only condition that they have allowed into that category has been Huntington's disease. Um, uh, in the US, um, in 2008, there was a very famous, well-advertised um, law called the GINA legislation, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Um, the big driving force in the states was healthcare insurance because it isn't a socialized healthcare system, and so therefore each person is individually ascertained. So getting this through was was massive because there was a significant percentage of the people who were uninsurable as it stood at the time. Um, it also pertains to employment as well, but doesn't go to life insurance. So they did try and put some uh, safeguards in place for life insurance, but largely doesn't pertain to that. So. Genetic discrimination policy and legislation in Australia, well, where are we up to? Well, the Australians did a, uh, had a law, the Australian Law Reform Commission and the NHMRC's HREC had a two-year inquiry after which they issued a massive two-volume report called Essentially Yours in 2003. And the AORC sim simultaneously funded the Genetic Discrimination Project, which kind of ran in tandem and as a reaction to that. So it started around 2002. And it explored the nature and the extent of genetic discrimination in Australia. So they did a number of studies where they looked directly at consumers through support groups, patients of, of clinical services. They looked at third parties. And they also looked at what legal framework existed to currently protect people against genetic discrimination. And the Federal Disability, oh, sorry, the Federal Disability Discrimination Act of 1992, which largely pertains to employment but can uh, pertain to some aspects of insurance as well, was amended in 2008 as a result of these recommendations uh, to specifically mention genetic um, predisposition. Um, there is a partial moratorium in Australia and New Zealand where insurers can't request that a person undergo genetic testing. But if they have undergone genetic testing, they do have the right to the results of those. So a very um, much weaker moratorium than you've seen in other countries, unfortunately. In Queensland, we have the Anti-Discrimination Act of 1991, but that has yet to be modified. Other states like New South Wales and Victoria have their own genetic non-discrimination laws. But unfortunately, as it stands in Queensland at the moment, we have no such protection. And the federal law coverage has really yet to be tested legally. And do bear in mind that this was introduced in 2008, prior to whole exome, whole genome sequencing, and personalized medicine. So how robust it's going to be when all of us in the room have deleterious mutations in lots of important genes, um, we don't know yet. Okay. So, to take a step back and talk about the types of results that we get from whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing, we either get clinically relevant results uh, that are related to the diagnostic question, results of unclear uh, clinical significance, clinically or socially relevant individual, um, clinically or socially relevant information that's relevant to the individual and the family but it's not actually relevant to the reason as to why they had the test done in the first place. So you go and have a test done for one thing, and it finds out that you're a carrier for BRCA1 or 2, et cetera. And those that are not clinically relevant, which everybody agrees should not be reported. Particularly relevant to whole exome and whole genome sequencing are these variants of uncertain significance and incidental findings, which I'd like to talk more about. Now, variants of uncertain significance are not new in genetics. Well, BRCA1 and 2 are our classic examples of where variants of uncertain significance came into it. The reason is you're talking about extremely large genes where novel variants are very um, often arise. And it can be very difficult to interpret. Is that variant disease causing? Is that the reason why this woman had breast cancer or ovarian cancer? Or is that a variant from one person to the other in the general population? And how they used to handle that is if there were enough surviving members of the family, they'd go back and say, well, Aunt Mary had ovarian cancer. Does she carry the same variant? That would increase our confidence that this is indeed what caused it and look for segregation. Um, but obviously, um, that's not something that is going to be routinely happened in whole exome and whole genome. 
And this is something that's very difficult, I can tell you as a genetic counselor, to explain to people. One of the reasons that drives people to have genetic testing in the first place is their desire to end uncertainty, to aid in decision making and, and coping. And so you're telling them, well, we found this variant in you, but we don't know whether this is the reason why you had breast cancer when you were 32, or if this is just a variation between Mary and Aideen. And if you sequence both of our genomes, you'd find differences between us. So it's a very, very difficult thing for people to get their head around. And some will understand, um, particularly those who are more cognitively coping mechanisms can, and numerically minded and cope quite well. But others find it very challenging. And in the desire to end uncertainty, we'll very often dichotomize. Some people will say, right, this is the mutation that caused me to have breast cancer. And someone else will say, no, it's not. And in the women who say, yes, it is the mutation that caused me to have breast cancer, I'm going to have a prophylactic mastectomy on my other breast because now I carry the gene mutation. And very often, that will be counter to their doctor's advice. But this is how people have coped in those situations. So, the classifications of such variants has improved a lot over time. Emma mentioned EXAC and other databases like that, and Paul talked about classification and all of the lengths that we go to to do that. And so that's improved a lot, but there's still about 20% of women who get variants of uncertain significance from this test. So incidental findings. So when I started working for Matt, he wanted to do whole exome sequencing on a research basis. And one of the jobs I had to do was write ethics application to consent people to these studies. And one of the things that we warned people about is in the process of looking for the mutation that caused your condition or your child's condition, it is possible that we may inadvertently find a mutation in another gene that we know of that causes another condition. And in that event, if it is an, an actionable gene where treatment or screening is available, we would like to offer you that information back. Um, so it was considered accidentally um, discovered, and it was covered in the consent forms. And this was true for both a research basis and also for a clinical basis. However, in 2013, the American College of Medical Genetics issued new recommendation guidelines in which they said that if a, a person was having whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing done for any reason at all, that when they were having that done, they should automatically be screened for 56 actionable genes that, um, were, uh, that related to 24 different conditions. These are highly penetrant conditions. They're clinically actionable. And they predominantly include hereditary cancer disposition and sudden cardiac death, OK? And there was no inclusion of recessive disorders or pharmacogenomics. And they also said that patient preferences shouldn't be taken into account. So there shouldn't be any a la carte testing, basically. Um, ordering clinicians should discuss with the patient the possibility of finding incidental findings and that laboratories should seek and report findings from the list without reference to patient preference. Uh, patient age should not be taken into account. Tailoring the report of such information according to the age of the patient could place an unrealistic burden on laboratories. And they acknowledged that you might have ethical concerns with this, but any ethical concerns would be outweighed by the potential benefit to future health of child and the child's parents. And that reporting incidental findings to ordering clinicians not be limited by the age of the person being sequenced. They also went on to say that we should be careful to document in the patient's record the rationale for any significant deviation from these recommendations set forth in the guidelines. There was a lot of reaction <laughs> in the clinical genetics world. So I particularly like the whole, we need to talk uh, one. Um, uh, and in fact, 150 responses in less than six months. Um, they did give them some kudos. They said, listen, your motivations are honorable. You want to avoid um, you know, the, uh, the trauma and um, uh, associated with conditions that could be treated or intervened earlier. And it is commendable that you came up with a list. Instead of just looking at 21,000, you said, right, this is a manageable list. That is a lot more uh, tenable than doing 21,000. That was where the support ended. And after that, it was concern. Um, concern on multiple levels. Well, one, from an evidentiary point of view, 
So Emma told you already that we know that whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing is very effective at diagnosing rare disorders, identifying new genes, and are applicable in conditions caused by multiple different genes. However, many of the 56 genes on the list were very rare, and some of them had only been discovered in a year or two prior to that. So there was a lack of evidence regarding the predictive value, and there was a lack of evidence about the spectrum of the phenotypes that you might get associated with those genes, and there was also a lack of evidence about the efficacy of interventions in those cases. And in fact, most people said this is actually not incidental. In the true meaning of the word, this is actually screening. And as such, screening should only be instituted when there is compelling evidence that it improves the health outcomes of asymptomatic people. And when considering introducing screening, you should explore the potential for ambiguous results, which obviously we have, unnecessary workup, work iatrogenic harm, so harm from the actual test in itself, and false reassurance. And of relevance, in 2013, after a couple of years of um, uh, discussion and debate, the US Preventative Services Task Force actually recommended against referral for BRCA testing in asymptomatic women in the general population based on a systematic review of the potential benefits and harms. And they recommended that we carry on with the family history and medical history approach in selecting women, which women should have bracket testing. They also said there's logistical concerns. So you have to make sure that people are adequately consented. So you can imagine you've got no family history of Emma's pheochromocytoma. And I've got to convey to you in a session not only the risks of testing for the particular condition that you have or your child has, but I've got to make you understand kind of what the nuances are of testing for the others. Some could say, listen, these fall into two broad categories, and you could counsel people about hereditary cancers on one hand and sudden deaths on the other. Um, but it's, it still has a lot of challenges with it, and there's a lot, a lot for a lot of people who would feel adequately trained to feel comfortable doing that kind of consenting process. Clients need to be made aware of the limitations of the test. And then again, what um, Paul and Emma have spoken to, this variant interpretation and classification is no small thing. It's extremely challenging. And in fact, a recent study said if you take um, a a 6,500 exomes, and you look at the variants in those, and you get multiple people to code whether those variants are, are damaging or not, there's actually very poor correlation between coders, somewhere in the magnitude of 50%. Um, uh, there's limited databases, and some of those have incorrect entries associated with disease, because five years ago we thought it was disease-causing, but now we've sequenced thousands more people, and we know it actually occurs in the general population in the absence of disease. And it's also very time consuming. It takes about 37 minutes per variant to work out whether or not this is going to be damaging or not. And this study found that about 1.6% of Caucasians and about 1% of Africans will have a true bona fide mutation of um, clinical significance at the end of all of that. So ethical concerns obviously were uh, significant. So overriding individual autonomy. So only the year prior, the American College had issued a statement saying that patients should be given the option of not receiving certain or secondary findings and leave genetics out of it. In medicine in general, competent adults have the right to refuse um, any medical test or treatment, whether that's a blood transfusion or a genetic test. So it kind of over uh, ignored that. It also contradicts previous guidelines on genetic testing in children. Now, I haven't mentioned all of the guidelines. There's numerous ones for European, Australasian, and, and American, American Academy of Pediatrics. But basically, the intentional screening of the child aimed at putative parental benefit is not endorsed. And in past policies, it's, uh, it was concluded that one should avoid testing children for adult onset diseases as it's inconsistent with the child's best interest. There's also iatrogenic complications, psychological harm. So I went in because my child had multiple congenital anomalies and we wanted to find out what the diagnosis is. And now you tell me that my child is also carrying mutation for hereditary colon cancer, you know, processing all of that. And also the issue of classifying variants, the risk of false positives. And that's the primary reason why many US labs still haven't adopted the ACMG recommendations, is because of the risk of false positives. So um, 
shortly after that, about six months later, the ACMG actually issued a clarification paper. Oops, my bad. <laughs> we didn't really mean that. What we meant was this paper was for educational purposes and has no legal implications at all. And you don't have to put in the notes that why you decided not to use our recommendations. And it's not an industry. And actually, maybe we should actually give patients choice about what test they would like to have. So opt out clause. So um, uh, then the Human Genetic Society of Australasia, around the same time, um, put out a statement saying that they believe that caution should be exercised in adoption to the ACMG recommendations. And some aspects of the recommendations represent a significant change from previously accepted guidelines on genetic testing, especially in relation to ethical principle of an autonomy and testing in minors. Okay. So the European Society this year have issued a, a, a paper about the fact that basically saying we're working on it, we're still discussing it, we haven't reached any conclusions yet, but here are the things that we're concerned about. Um, uh, they basically said that the ACMG's guidelines were contradict you know, all the other ethical principles existing prior to that that I told you about. They had ethical and legal concerns around consenting, the interpretation and reporting of variants of uncertain significance and incidental findings, the storage of data. Do we store it indefinitely and reanalyze it two years from now when we know more? Or do we get rid of it and think resequencing is cheaper, as Paul said, than the cost of storing it? And also, when do you disclose the information? You, you know, as I said, the whole neonatal um, uh, child with multiple congenital anomalies, um, when do you start talking about hereditary colon cancer? Um, and they were more optimistic of the possibility of finding a consensus now that the ACMG had allowed for an opt-out clause. So in brief, moving forward, um, everybody said there needs to be more of inclusive conversation. So all the people in the ACMG guidelines were largely geneticists. We need to have um, primary care physicians, public health physicians, policy, general pathology researchers, bioethicists, and healthcare consumers on this panel coming to this decision. Everyone now agrees that clients need to have a choice. Most people agree that children shouldn't be tested for adult onset conditions. And we need to learn more about what clients want. So there's mixed studies to date. And they suggest that they really don't want variants of uncertain significance. And, and um, they have mixed feelings about incidental findings. And there should be discussion around who will be doing the cons consenting and returning of results. And um, we need more evidence. Before we roll this out as a test, we need more evidence about sensitivity, specificity, et cetera. Um, there's to minimize the false positives and the ambiguous findings, the positive predictive value in the absence of a family history. So when you found a mutation before, I, I can't, you know, as Emma said, I do gene discovery, I'm very lucky, but very often you'll get minimal information about how that child is affected and you find a gene and you'll think, this does look kind of promising, but they didn't say anything about the kidneys. And in the mouse and in everything else, the kidneys are involved. And then you contact the clinician, and they go, oh, yeah, they're an end-stage renal failure. And you're like, oh, now it makes sense. It's perfect, you know? But so you need that in the absence of any family history or medical history, that interpretation step gets more challenging. We need more data from diverse populations, from diverse ethnicities. And we need reliable data on phenotypic spectrum. Newborn screening was introduced about five years ago for a lysosomal storage disorder, Crab A disease, because they thought that the vast majority of people presented in childhood. They now know that 90% of the people who have these mutations present in adulthood. And so you've got a lot of patients in waiting in those situations. We need a policy on data storage. What do we do with it in the future? And screening requires us to have resources for timely and appropriate follow-up. And we also need the proof that the net benefit is at an acceptable cost. Thank you very much.